So this is a little panel that I've been doing at DevGAMS for about four years now. Uh, we call it the Indie Survival Guide. Um, and what we usually do in the conferences in Minsk, uh, Kiev, and Moscow is discuss what kind of issues do indie developers face. And um, recently, I changed up the format to be like a lunch session. So we actually have about 90 minutes for this panel. And um, we actually do not rehearse it at all. I literally just grab people and say, OK, now we're doing an indie survival guide. And the reason we don't do this is because um, I actually don't know where this is going to go at all. Um, and the, the question that we have here to answer for all of us is, I'm an indie game developer. How do I survive? And by survive, I mean uh, keep on doing what I love. So here I have a very um, interesting uh, set of people that um, come from different backgrounds that have different um, backstories, projects, and et cetera. So actually, to kick it off, uh, we have a replacement. So instead of uh, Vera Velichka, who, is, uh, who did not get a visa for uh, the US from Russia, uh, we have a replacement with, uh, am I saying this right, Chad Jenkins, right? So we have Chad Jenkins instead of Vera. Uh, we have uh, Ty Taylor, who uh, made a little game called Tumblestone, which launched today on mobile. Go download it now. <laughs> We have a Christopher Floyd from Indies Workshop and Radial Games. And we have Chris Taylor, who you may know for different things. <laughs> Made uh, one of my favorite games. And uh, I'm Alex Nietzsche-Portschik. I uh, founded Tiny Build a few years ago, and you may know a couple of our games like Punch Club or Hello Neighbor. So to start off this panel, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot in Eastern Europe is um, well, what I just discussed, Vera did not get a visa. So traveling uh, to conventions is actually quite difficult. And uh, we spend a lot of time talking about Gamescom logistics and how to go to PAX Dev, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think for framing, I need to hand off, like, uh, do a round of introductions so that you guys understand where each perspective is coming from. And then we'll steer the discussion over there. So Chris, would you like to start? Well, sure. Is this on? Oh, great. So uh, in fairness, um, uh, calling me an indie developer expert is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, if you use Save and Private Ryan as a metaphor, I'm just coming off the Higgins boat. Uh, and these guys are well into France. So you know, I mean, that's sort of the, the difference here. Don't want to put that right out there. Um, uh, so you know, what I sort of joke around uh, when I talk about indie development is that it was what indie development is today is kind of like what gaming was 30 years ago because the team sizes like uh, you know were one person on a team you had one artist you had a, someone who did sound part time so you know it was a really small endeavor and that's kind of where I started but before that I did stuff at home you know uh, unpaid and that that I feel sort of strange because here I am literally 30 years later having come full circle. And I'm finding that a lot of the things that I used to do back then are now really valuable assets. Um, so I'm finding that indie game development for me is, uh, is really refreshing and uh, really exciting for me. And I'm probably the most excited about what I'm working on uh, than, uh, than, say, maybe Total Annihilation Dungeon Siege, like right in there. You know? So I'm pretty, I'm pretty fired up. I'm pretty open. I'm 50 years old. Not a lot of people who are 50 have a, uh, are, you know, usually they're kind of heading for the exit, to be honest with you, in this business. So I'm excited to, to really be uh, fired up about this uh, going forward. All right. So you, you are hands down the most experienced on this panel. Uh, you've been in AAA, and then you're saying that the old AAA, the inception like 20 years ago, is a lot like the indie scene today. Yeah, because India is kind of caught up in a sense. Uh, to where it was, so all these right. all these lines on the graph start to cross. So that's an interesting perspective, uh, Chris. Yeah. You've been around the block, right? I guess. I don't know if my mic's on. Is it on? I think, I think it's, it's on. on. Um, I can't resist making the joke that if you're just off the boat, I literally lived in France for a while, so I actually have been in France for a bit. Um, I am. What do I do? Uh, I've done a lot of community building. Um, my one of my initial things I was really surprised about with games was that you had a bunch of big famous names and then invisible teams behind them. And I was always like, it's super weird that we never seem to like 
really encourage everyone to get to be known. And then over the last couple of years, I've noticed how that has, um, I think, caused, <laughs> caused some big problems. Um, but uh, I like building a lot of communities together. I like, I'm super into DIY attitudes to things. Uh, what I like about indie games is that they tend to be things people actually care about making. Um, and people get to do whatever they want, and they kind of do it by figuring out problems as they hit them, uh, which I think is pretty exciting. So what do you do at Radial? Uh, at Radial, I am a developer. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> as a team of, I'm sure all of you are from similar sized teams, but when you're a team of like five or six people, everybody kind of does everything. I recently built a website. I'm currently texting Microsoft from that seat <laughs> about something else. So. Lots of work. Right. Well, from my understanding, and one of the reasons I called you to this panel is, mm -hmm. well, you know, we all know what you did for the Mega Boost, so I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> like, that was amazing for us, at least. Like, our first game, no Thanks. time to explain, was showcased there, and that's how we got a lot of traction. Awesome. And then cool. we, you know, started publishing. Yeah. But um, you also are working on a well-known, established IP at Razio. Is that mm -hmm. the correct assumption? Yeah, with Fantastic Contraption. Yeah. yeah, so Fantastic Contraption. And then uh, you come from a perspective where you have an established IP that you've been bringing to a lot of different platforms. Mm -hmm. And the most recent one is PlayStation VR, if I'm yes. correct. All right, yeah. so you come from a perspective of you guys are a small team. Yeah. You're indies. You have an established IP. You're, you have a steady revenue stream from that IP that you're bringing to more and more platforms. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a totally different perspective from Chris's. And I think uh, let's move on to Ty. Sure. Ty, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you come from and what you're working on? Um, so, is my mic on? Uh, we need to make the, those mics a little bit louder, please. All right, uh, my name is Ty Taylor. I've been uh, making games starting as like a hobby for the last 12 years, started in high school where I just taught myself how to program from basically nothing. Um, I think I, I really took off in the indie game industry with the bridge. Uh, basically, I worked only on it during nights and weekends. Oh, if you don't know what the bridge is, it's a, uh, a 2D black and white puzzle platformer in the style of MC Escher. Uh, think Braid, but instead of controlling time, you're controlling gravity. Um, so I worked on that nights and weekends uh, throughout grad school and while working at Microsoft, uh, basically moonlighting the entire game. Uh, it shipped on Steam early 2013 and uh, did much better than I was expecting. Um, basically, when I started the project, it was totally as a hobby, so I was seriously in the mindset of, like, I will just put this out for free. I don't even expect it to make money, but then uh, it basically made so much that I just left Microsoft and started my own company. Um, um, after, after that, I started working on Tumblestone, and so uh, me and my team have been working on that for over three years now, and, uh, like, Alex mentioned it just launched today on, on mobile, so, you know. Uh, sh sh shameless plug, take out your phone right now, search for Tumblestone and rate it five stars. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Um, so, yeah. And it's free, right? We had a little argument about this, but we can get into that later. We can, we can talk about free to play versus yeah, about premium, but yes, selling it's free your to soul. play on mobile. <laughs> like free to play is the only way to launch games on, on mobile if you want to. Yeah, like, and make you also more. had an Xbox Live deals was gold on the launch of Tumblestone. That, yeah, that's right. And um, so, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into this a, a lot more later, but with with the bridge, it was definitely the traditional model of selling games. It was early 2013, like, it was paid on Steam. It was on the front page of Steam for over two weeks, and like... Yeah, we launched No Time to Explain in, in December, uh, no, in January 2014, and yeah, that was a good time yeah, to launch Yeah, it, it was a really good time, but that time is gone, um, and so you definitely have to look through different avenues, like free to play on mobile, or <laughs> game, games with gold on Xbox, both, both great options. Yeah, so you come from a uh, different journey. You had a successful indie game that launched on Steam before the saturation happened, and now you have your second game out uh, that launched with the deals with gold, and now is coming out on mobile, and I guess we'll find out quite soon how the free-to-play release is going for yep. you. All right, so that is, again, a totally different perspective, and let's uh, get an introduction from Chad before we dive into the discussions. Hello, I'm Chad Jenkins, and I suppose my path has been a little bit atypical. I actually started out as a modder originally, and I made a very popular mod for Kerbal Space Program, which actually led to me getting hired by the development team there. So I worked on Kerbal Space Program for a number of years, and I ended up working with Dan Dixon over here on Universe Sandbox 2. So most of my experience has been from indie games that have like six-year dev cycles, um, that have like episodic content that are very like systemic and driven. 
And I just recently started my own company and we're working on our first title now. So it's been transitioning from working on these big successful indie titles to trying to launch my own company and sort of go through that process from scratch has been sort of where I'm going right now. And that was the game name that you're working on right now? Yeah, the game I'm working on right now is called Phantom Brigade. It's a turn-based tactical game, very much in the classic style, like in PlayStation titles. Right, and uh, from what I understand, you're also working with a distributed team. Yeah, so um, all the games that I've worked on have been distributed. Kerbal Space Program was in Mexico City, and I was working for the United States. Universe Sandbox was the same thing until I actually moved here to Seattle. And my team is distributed around the world. I'm the only American on our team, actually. The rest of the team's in Vancouver, where Power Up Audio is doing our sound and music. And then we have uh, the rest of my employees are actually in Russia. So working with them and dealing with like time zones. And unfortunately, I ran into the same problem. Could you problem. hold your microphone just a little bit? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, ran into the same problem where my coworker and co-founder, Artyom, is not going to be able to make it to PAX due to the visa issues. So. Sucks. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's one of the things that I've been struggling with a lot um, is, uh, like, I actually have no citizenship in the world, which is, like, 200,000 people in the world have that. Basically, when the Soviet Union fell, um, the ethnic Russians, whose parents were uh, not from a single country or not from a single republic in, in the Soviet Union, uh, their kids didn't get citizenship. So whenever I travel to the US, uh, often they'll swipe my passport and just glitches out and then they have to call management over. So that's a lot of fun. I need to be at airports four hours in between. But I don't think that's an issue for you guys because you're all uh, here based in Seattle. So uh, I think um, a good way to kick this off is like, uh, we all know that discoverability is everyone's number one issue. So I think let's do a round of, um, like I already asked that question from uh, the FTL Fireside Chat. Like today, if you're making a game today, what is your number one shot or number one uh, priority to get it discovered by people? Like how do you approach that, that issue? And we can just start wherever. You want me to try that? Well, um, in my case, um, I can leverage uh, you know, the fact that I've, my name has been out there for a while, you know, and uh, that, um, that goes, that, that, that's pretty good. I did this little story, there was this whole story that came out of Eurogamer when I was in Croatia, and, you know, it just, just it got a little bit of, uh, you know, traction because, uh, you know, folks are, you know, they, they, you know the, we live in a world where you, when someone recognizes a name, um, they seem to just pay attention to it more. It's just one of those things. So it's like a little bit of, uh, you get a little bit of gravitas around a, a reputation and a name. So I'm, I'm using that. Um, it, would, it would kill me to have to advertise what I'm working on and pay money to advertise for it. So to be honest with you guys, I'm not really interested in advertising. I figure if I work on something and it's not interesting for, you know, a thousand of my friends on Facebook, you got to put the friends in quotes, um, but... Uh, I think I'm up to 4,500 close personal friends. Um, but if a thousand of them don't want to check out my game and they don't like it, well then, then I've done a shitty job. That's my attitude. So, you know, well, I'm- Well, you have uh, the definite benefit of having street cred in uh, the industry for a while and having just the name, it definitely helps a lot. But like, uh, so I'm, I'm really wondering, uh, when you have an established IP like uh, radio games have, um, Chris, when did, when did uh, the game originally release? I think the first Fantastic Contraption is about almost 10 years old. Yeah, I think so, because it was a Flash game, if I remember correctly. Right, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. It was... yeah so how does a game, and it's the main product still of the company. Mm -hmm. So how does a game that released 10 years ago still have legs? Uh, so guide us through. This is going to sound incredibly reductive, but here we are. Um, I think the reason that something like Fantastic Contraption can work as a game that's releasing 10 years since it was initially born um, and still be like a successful game, like I mean it's profitable, yada, 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 um, is by taking a product that's interesting and then figuring out what makes it remarkable and what makes it relevant. Um, I, I think this is like, if I could tell anyone anything about the thing they're working on is like, it doesn't matter how good it is if nobody cares. And if, if it's really bad and everybody cares, it will still do well. So like, 
it doesn't, it's almost like this is like the most annoying thing to tell, like, I guess, designers, but like, your design doesn't super matter for the success of the game. Like, the fact that people care about it is what's going to make it successful. And so if you can find ways to make Sorry, it... Ty, if you disagree, you, let's uh, disagree <laughs> right here. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'll finish and then I'll hand it to you. Um, so like, so something like, like Contraption, like what's, like the design of it was rock solid, but the design was always, uh, as like what, uh, what I feel like Justin was talking about earlier, but like incredibly sandboxy play. Like we, one of my favorite things to see is like when people, we just recently released on PlayStation VR, and when you see people talk about, people either totally like get it and immediately love it, or else they complain that like there's not enough stuff in the game. And I'm like, the fact that there's the reason there's not stuff in the game is because the stuff is like in your head. Like the game is giving you the ability to have fun with those things. Um, but the reason the game is now like 10 years old and having new new like iterations of it releasing are because when virtual reality came along. Contraption was a super interesting thing to explore with VR, right? It was like now the fun of like dragging sticks on a browser can be way more fun when you're like literally just like building big machines around you, right? And I think like later on, Chad can come to the like the Kerbal Space Program and I think like Universe Sandbox kind of thing of like giving people stuff and then just letting them have fun it happens to be fun kind of wherever you do it, right? So go ahead. Oh, I was just going to disagree with the, the one statement that you made. I'm just going to stand up and say you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're, only, you're only half wrong. Um, basically, I, I feel like the, the idea of the, a game doesn't necessarily have, need to have good design in order to, to sell well only applies to AAA. You see this in, in film, too, a lot, because like these major blockbuster hits that are absolute garbage on Rotten Tomatoes still like make hundreds of millions of dollars in box office. It applies to AAA, too, because they have marketing budget. Like If you get enough, like if you pay enough streamers and you pay enough for, for any kind of, of marketing, then that, that's, that's possible. But for indies who don't really have any marketing budget besides you know, sending emails and giving away free Steam keys, especially if they don't have a name behind them, it has to be fundamentally like, great or unique uh, design as well to, in order to, to take off. You know what, I'd love to see the balance sheet on one of those Hollywood movies where they dumped, you know, they generated revenue, but they put it back into advertising. And we right. see that in free to play, where it's been adver it's advertising continuously and then the cost, uh, you know, the cost to acquire new users. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, maybe the area under the curve would be greater if they didn't advertise at all. And you just, you, how could they know, right? Possibly, but they've been doing it this way for a while, like back in film, so maybe it's, they have the data to say it's working. Well, I also, to that point, um, yeah. today um, movies have this interesting tendency where, at least in the last couple of years, years, we've all seen what's happening behind the scenes at DC and Warner Brothers. And that has been a glorious train wreck. Wonder Woman was great, but everything like Suicide Squad, Batman v Superman, people seem to be getting a lot more interested in why things are failing. And this is also what I noticed was our fan base on the gaming space. People are really interested to know how things are being made. And it feels like they really relate to the fans, relate to what is happening behind the scenes. And if they understand why things are happening, why are they good or bad, that creates a really vocal community that does help you know, indies like us stand out a little bit. Do you guys have any experience with that, with communities driving your sales in any shape or form? I guess. I think I often view the indie game market as like very similar to the people who enjoy playing indie games because they're indie games, enjoy them for the same reason people like going to farmers markets and spending like four times as much on a salmon burger, right? Like so we like, should price 4X for our indie games? Correct, yeah, absolutely you should. Um, but like I think the idea of like, I think a couple of years ago I was talking to a friend about it, but like the idea of like farm to table game development, you know, is like, that's kind of what's happened in the last couple of years of like, uh, like Justin was saying earlier about how, uh, how streaming has become so important to making a game. And that's kind of where I would, where, what my rebuttal to your design thing was going to be that like, streamers don't care if it's well designed, they care if it's like fun to see, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, but, so the idea of like making a thing that is, like for a while, I think there was a, a kind of a perspective within the indie industry of, we can do this on our own, you know, like, we don't need to be a team of 4,000 people and, like, published by Activision and yada, yada, yada. It's like, we can just sit down, we can think about the things we think are important, we can make that thing and then kind of, like, release it into the world. 
Um, and people get into that because they like the story. Like, I think Indie Game the Movie has maybe done more harm than good <laughs> for, for a lot of aspiring developers. But it, it certainly like sold that thing of like, the game, the fact that the game is good is like this much of the interest. And the fact that like, it you know totally took over someone's life and it's all about this like manic obsession that they suffered from that they were like, I have to make this thing, this is how it has to happen. Like that is, that's what gets people going, whoa, cool, like I wanna, I wanna play that now, right? Well, I think humans love a good story, and the press Absolutely. likes a good story. So if your game has a nice narrative that resonates really well with traditional press. But from my perspective, I consider building a community to be one of the most important things. Like, if you look at the early days of Kerbal Space Program, like, we were going out on, like, space forums and just trying to get people interested in the game and find the audience. And then it sort of started growing after itself. We got, like, live streamers coming in. We got people who were scientists, like... Scott Manley started covering the game. And most of our focus was on the community itself. And that actually led into mods, and it kind of fed off of itself. And actually being out there, working on them, like one-on-one, -on -one, forming a dialogue, uh, I believe was a really big part of making that game successful. And once that starts to happen, you get this sort of like effect where everybody starts crowding around something, and you're like, hmm, what's going on over there? Am I missing out on something interesting? And the press is like, I keep seeing this coming up on Reddit. It must be something I should write about. Um, and I'm trying to basically, that, that sort of nightmare scenario that was uh, postulated earlier where, where Justin was talking about how he would market a game is exactly what I'm living like right now. It's sort of like I'm looking at Steam Direct, I'm looking at all these things that have changed, and I'm sort of like, I, Trying to get the attention of traditional press has been extremely difficult. Uh, but I've actually had a lot of success talking to live streamers, talking to people on Twitch, going on like um, things like Twitter, using Reddit, and going direct to the community has actually been what's been useful. And using like Discord to actually have a community for alpha testers and stuff has been really valuable for me. Can you talk more about Discord? Because that has been a buzzword in the indie space for the past few months. Yeah. How do you guys use it? Uh, what, it, what works, what doesn't, what are the do's and don'ts? So partly, uh, I got sold on the idea of Discord uh, from a good friend, Andy, who works at uh, Pocket Watch Games. You know, they're working on Tooth and Tail right now. And they're forming, like, they have this sort of problem with multiplayer games where you have to have a community to have a successful multiplayer game because if you log on and the game is phenomenal, but there's no one to play with, that's going to be a dead multiplayer game very quickly. So it's sort of like this chicken and egg issue. So they've been using Discord to bring in alpha testers to form a community. They've done a lot of automation on there. Like you could do a whole talk about that actually. It's a very interesting topic, but I started doing it so I could coordinate with alpha testers and start building a community. We've had people already start modding the game at this stage, even though it's like super early. Uh, but those people who are passionate about that have given us phenomenal feedback. They've been great advocates. They've been going out, bringing more people in, and they're very proud of like, hey, you know, I can talk directly to the devs. I can form like a relationship with them. It's sort of filling in what like a forum did, but it's a lot more, you know, like reactive and quick. And people can form their own little groups and chat. And I've actually found it to be quite useful. Well, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, going to all of these communities and whatnot. And uh, what they see indie devs often do is they see a post on Reddit, and then they think that the game is successful because of the post on Reddit. But it does feed off of that. I mean, it, that, that can happen. But what you mentioned earlier is a very interesting subject, is uh, Kerbal Space Program. It's a space game. And there was nothing really like that at the time. And then you went to space forums. That is something very interesting. Like right now, I believe still today, uh, the car mechanic game is still in the top charts. Who would have expected that? I mean, I didn't. And then I just log in and go like, well, I can fix cars, so that's great. Um, so you're saying that a really good avenue to start in is actually find the niche that you're in and see where the players might be that are not necessarily already flooded with other indie games. So. Maybe this isn't the best analogy, but I look at it sort of like rolling a snowball down a hill. You want to start as early as possible, but you want to find like the kernel that you build on. You know, like a pearl being formed in an oyster. You're like you got to find your core audience, and those people are worth their weight in gold. Like I would so much rather have a few of those guys than have like a really big YouTuber who 
whose community doesn't care about my game. I want to find the guy on YouTube with like 20,000 viewers or something who is super passionate about the kind of game that I'm making, and I want to win him over. And as you do that, you sort of build this sort of grassroots, um, ground up approach instead of trying to go like really high level and casting a wide net that you end up not getting a lot of people who are actually like really interested in your product. Like those, those advocates, um, that's like for me the benefit of going to shows like going to PAX East. I actually got a lot of people who were like super into the game and to this day they're in my Discord like recruiting new people, bringing new people in. They're very like proud of being able to help. It's sort of like this underdog mentality where they really like feel passionate and have like a sense of ownership over the game that you don't really get with like a big AAA title. Do you have any challenges managing that group? So yeah, I mean, not, I mean, it depends what you mean. Like for me, it takes away time from development, right? Right. And I wear a lot of hats. So it's like I got to market the game, got to do design, work with my employees, do payroll, like everything, but I still have to make the game as well. So trying to manage my time, what I've done is I've just said, okay, this is the times that I'll be on Discord, and I'll give them like an hour, and I'm just 100% available to the community. I'll be posting things on Reddit and, and you know, doing research and trying to get the word out about the game, but making it sort of compartmentalized like that is how I manage it, because if I just left it open and let them message me anytime, I wouldn't get anything done. You'd go crazy, yeah. Yeah, I'd go mad. Um, would you feel comfortable sharing what size that community is? Um, I would if I knew the exact number, but it's, <laughs> sure. it's been growing organically. Um, I think we've, we've given out like over 500 alpha keys already, and those have all been activated by and large. Yeah. Um, and the Discord community, I think it's a few hundred. We actually got Discord partnership recently, so that's been going well, and it's just sort what, of growing organically. What does that mean? Uh, well, Discord has a partner program where you actually get like a, a discrete URL. So instead of like an invite code, you just go to like discord.gg slash phantom brigade and boom, you're like right there. Uh, and that's better for like marketing and putting on like our press materials and things like that. And it gives us sort of like a, a community anchor and a sort of a sense of, it's like getting the check on Twitter, right? You know, we're like we're more official um, than we were otherwise, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say. Right. Um, I think, well, just to wrap up the whole YouTuber and streamer subject, because uh, there are panels where people can talk about it for hours and hours. Three years ago, YouTube, major YouTuber plays your game, sales spike. A year and a half ago, a major live streamer plays your game, your sales spike. Right now, I can confirm that the same thing is happening. A niche YouTuber plays your game is super excited about, and um, people will gravitate towards that more. Versus, like, uh, you know, if someone major plays your game, you will not see a major sales spike because those YouTubers are being watched for their personalities versus the games that they play. Uh, those games are gone. But if YouTubers and streamers are off the, the table, well, for us, with no budgets, and AAA is already throwing budgets there, what can we do outside of that? Discord is a really cool option, and I think there's a lot to discuss because it's in its early days uh, of becoming more mainstream towards using for marketing. Uh, what other avenues are there? Can anyone share any light on that? Ty? Well, I think um, a lot of what we talk about with marketing, going after press or YouTubers or streamers, is, is definitely, you know, you know, back in the day, and by that I mean a year and a half ago, of uh, selling a, a premium game, uh, like on Steam, just sell your game for $10 or whatever and expect people to buy it. But now I think, uh, one of, the, one of the better ways for an indie game to, to make money is to go uh, after deals with publishers and, and platform holders directly. And, um, you know, the, the dream of being like the next uh, Minecraft or even Super Meat Boy and just like making bank on, on your game through organic sales is harder and harder and harder as you get so many games. But like in our case, we did uh, Xbox's Games with Gold program, which gave every single user on Xbox Live uh, a copy of Tumblestone. And that was like... I, I mean, I can't say the exact amount, but you know, basically the way it works is Microsoft hands us a large bag of money, and then that is that paid for development. Um, but then we also did like the humble monthly uh, similar situation, and then we have you know publisher lineups doing more similar situations, and it's kind of like a flip flop from my release of the bridge, which was I didn't do anything like that, and it was all organic. So um, as an indie, like 
one of the things I would do is like if, if it's like getting really popular, getting uh, you know awards or something, it's like selected for Mega Booth or PAX 10 or anything like that. You're going to get attention of Microsoft and Sony and, and Humble and, and anyone else doing these kinds of deals. So that's definitely an avenue that I think people need to pursue. Yeah. Did you do any DLC when you launched on Deals Was Gold? Uh, yeah, kind of. Um, basically, it was a uh, we have we have a lot of different game modes in Tumblestone, and our DLC was we we cut a piece off of off of the game, and rather than charging twenty five dollars like we do on Steam, we charged twenty and then five for the extra, which was super weird. But Microsoft wanted it because they want to launch with DLC. Um, uh, players on Xbox crucified us for it, but. <laughs> Um, so you feel like it wasn't worth it? No, I, I, for the DLC specifically? I, uh, yeah, just the monetary value of that. I don't know, we just did that because we had to. It was a stipulation to be on, uh, on Games with Gold. Um, or not, it, was, I, they, I, it was not a, like a hard stipulation. I, you know, I don't want to give too many uh, NDA details, but basic, basically um, you know, it, was, it was something Microsoft wanted, something I, I gave to them for that reason. But if that was make or break for doing Games with Gold, then yeah, that was worth it. Yeah, uh, I can confirm we did uh, speedrunners with Games Was Gold back in June, and then we did the same thing. We had the Steam build, which is like 15 bucks, and then we kind of like spliced it um, and uh, removed a bunch of skins and then uh, put them into DLC. And we actually, surprisingly, I didn't see any backlash from players whatsoever. And the numbers made that really, really worth it. Yeah. So. Definitely, definitely the numbers on games with gold. That's that's if you have the opportunity to do something like that with just a guaranteed. I think uh, Chris Charles is going to be stalked after this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, Chris, but um, basically, I, I think you handled uh, DLC probably better than we did with Tumblestone, which didn't have skins that we could do it. We basically just took a, a game mode, and people felt like you know the game modes here. You're just putting it behind a paywall, but it's that's in in my opinion kind of. A, them being a little bit entitled because they got the game for free. They can spend an extra $5 for some extra modes, but that's just their opinion. Well, I also think that, um, you know, not everyone can do a deals with gold. Obviously, there's like, what, 12 slots a year. Uh, but the Humble Monthly Fair. or similar things, uh, there is a lot of business innovation to be done on that part, I believe. Like, for example, in March, uh, we launched Streets of Rogue on Steam in Early Access. It has four-player co-op. And then we actually launched it with a free weekend just to get the online population up. And that was the reasoning why. So in Speedruns, which is also a four-player competitive game, uh, we had the problem that you mentioned. Um, I call it the curse of indie multiplayer. When no one's playing your game, your game is dead. Yeah. So we fixed that with a free weekend. Uh, and I think that was the right decision to do. And if everyone starts doing free weekends on launch, then obviously you know, it doesn't work. But there is a lot of things that you can do with different partners. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we did with Tumblestone. That's why we did Games with Gold. That's why we did Humble Monthly. And now we actually, you log on and you have someone to play with. Right, so we have uh, the option of going with partners with different business models. Um, what else can we think of right here or recommend, you know, aside of being Chris Taylor? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you do have street cred. So um, what, what kind of things are you working on right now? And... Um, how does that uh, make, you know, make a difference when you're being an indie uh, with a career behind you? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, I guess I'm going to find out, although there are some folks in the industry who came from the, the, the sort of more traditional industry, the AAA industry, you know, um, who are doing things. And, you know, they're out there really hustling for the money. You know, they're not just being written checks or... Maybe it's fair to say if, um, uh, you know, when I say written checks, I mean like, you know, the world's just not opening up and just letting them have, you know, uh, their way sort of thing and, and saying, oh, you're, you, you, you know, you made these big games, so therefore we're just going to, you know, the whole world's just going to come running to your door. Um, I see those people working very hard to get attention. I'm prepared for that. So I am sort of, you know, my ego says, you know, Chris, Yes, it would be nice if folks all took a good look at what you did, but um, the, the, you know it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't automatically mean success. They could basically take one little sniff of it and say, no, thank you. And no amount, and that was kind of what I was trying to say with my previous point, no amount of advertising or getting you know, PewDiePie or whoever to, to play your game is going to make your game successful if it's not a good game. So to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not really 
I'm not really focused on the on the PR side of it or the the outreach. I'm focused on making the best damn game I can, and I am prepared if I make the best game. Uh, you know, that takes everything I've learned, uh, and nobody likes it or nobody plays it. I'm prepared to go off and you know um, farm, you know sheep, or whatever uh, else is uh, you know tickles my ass at the time. You know, like because then I'll be done. You know, you, you go up to bat, you swing really, really hard, you know, and if, let me qualify this, if I was 21, I wouldn't be done. But at my age, after everything I've learned and everything I've done, if I swing really hard and I strike out, I truly am done, okay? And I have to accept that, and I'm, and I'm at peace with that. So I know I'm not answering your question, but I am sort of saying, you know, like at my, at the, at the place I'm at, if I don't know what the hell I'm doing in this business, then it's, it's time to go. There we go. Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Just a really dramatic, I'm done. Yeah, Come on. Yeah. You beat around the bush. You know, you say it, right? um, I think, I mean, I think to come back a little bit to the, to the kind of like platform discussion, just from a slightly, slightly reframing it, um, I think something to, to bear in mind as a lot of people start to approach, start to consider the problem of, I'm working on a game, and so is, I mean, theoretically, everybody in this room, right? Like, let's assume there's, I don't know, 100, 200 people here. Yeah, something like, like So we are all competing, in a right, way. Right, so there's, there's two, like 199 other people are doing the same thing you are, you know, modulo better or worse, like it doesn't really matter, right? Um, so how are you going to, how can you best try to secure a, some kind of success for what you're working on, right? And I think that's, what, that's when the platform discussion becomes interesting to me. I think it's not necessarily like gone are the days, but at the moment, if you are small and agile, yada, 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 you really should be thinking, what are these partners that are in the industry that are, like, you know, Humble's not a secret thing, like they're not hard to find, right? Like there's money that's hard to get and there's money that's like, kind of sitting there waiting for someone to go over and take it. And if you, can, if you can think about what it is that you can offer someone in exchange for like cash, it's like money can seem so important, but it's like so unimportant to the people that are holding it because what they need is not cash. Like they have money and they're like, take it. Like, can you make something interesting with this money? And as long as you can really convince them that the answer to that is yes, or like, you know, as likely as it can be, then they're going to love working with you. And once they work with you once, they're going to want to work with you again and again and again. And so, like, thinking about, like, trying to get in with, to games with gold or whatever is a great goal. But like you say, there's 12 slots per year, and you're probably not going to get there, like, odds on. Even if you're only against the people in this room already, there's 200 other people trying to get there, right? But if you can find someone who likes what you do and who, like, can trust you to produce it in exchange for... The, the costs of like your work for the next couple months or whatever, that's an amazing deal. Like you should absolutely go for that right now. Just just to kind of add on that a little bit, um, it's it's super helpful uh, from when you're from just the conception of the game to make something that is extremely unique for the marketplace right now and something that there there is a void uh, uh, in the market for it. We touched on this earlier, like there wasn't really a game like Kerbal Space Program before it, and uh, I guess with with, with Tumblestone, like there weren't like this competitive action puzzle game since SNES really, so it kind of fit the market well. And you know, not to speak for Microsoft, I'm sure Chris will do that plenty later, but um, I, I think with Games with Gold, like if you just look at the Games with Gold, a lot of the games, you know, Tumblestone included, are games that don't, aren't really on the marketplace. It's like games that Xbox wants. It's not even, I'm sure, just Games with Gold, just with any like title that you know, Xbox or PlayStation or Nintendo wants to sign, they want yeah. to sign something that brings something brand new to the platform that yeah, they don't there already was have. A great, uh, there was a great quote that I heard, that I hope I heard publicly, I can't remember for sure, but it was someone who was pretty high up at Sony, um, one of the like well-known names in their like kind of publishing and, and front-facing teams. Um, and it was an anecdote basically about the fact that pretty often he would see projects come by, like people, everyone's like, oh my God, Sony, please like publish our game or give us money for it, like whether it's Pub Fund or uh, what do they call PS Plus, the whole thing. Um, but they would often, he would be a strong advocate for them grabbing games which he did not believe would be successful in like almost any like 
performance metric, right? Like, the, the, it would be a game that people would be like, that's cool, but it would never kick off, right? And so everyone's like, why are they going to make that decision? And the attitude behind that was that as someone who is a representative of Sony, who makes a console that has a, like, you know, marketing demographic of, like, there's these kind of people play Sony games and yada, 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 he was always looking for, like, new ways to say, this is a game that, like, should be on PS4, right? Like, this is, like... Like, there's, there's a game uh, that I don't know if it's related to this, but if you know Bound, Bound is a game that, like, I heard loads of people talk about last year, and I had no idea what it was. And then I finally saw it, like, just last week. And it's this incredibly, like, beautiful abstract art ballet dancing game. And I am pretty confident that if you'd gone to Sony with that, or anywhere else, they would just be like, yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, it's like it's cool, but it's just not really going to perform, right? Well, I but think seeing um, that and going like that is that's exactly the kind of game that we want people to associate with what we do is priceless. So like, that's something important to think about. I think uh, for the sakes of our international audience that's watching us right now uh, live, um, it's all great, you know, like for Sony and uh, Microsoft. Uh, there, you know, Nintendo is here in the area as well. Sony is in San Francisco. Um, most game developers in the world don't have access to us, so we're actually quite fortunate here. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, other ways of forming community for your game, because I personally strongly believe that if you have a strong community behind your game before launch, it's going to benefit you. One of the things that we've been doing recently, um, uh, starting with Hello Neighbor and our other games, is we've been doing um, alphas and like essentially demos for versions of the game. So we would say, all right, here is the announcement trailer, here is the estimate release date, here is a link to sign up for the alpha. And then we gather an email list of people who are interested. And then as soon as we have that alpha, we send it to them and then link to the Steam forum saying, here is where you can post feedback. And I've seen it with five games now in a row where that just explodes for us. You should definitely be doing that. It's really easy to set up on MailChimp to gather emails. And that's essentially to the subject of uh, partnering up with a platform. You can also essentially create your own platform. And right now for Neighbor, uh, we have over a million people that downloaded the alpha and I have all of their emails and I can reach them out directly. Have you experimented with Discord at all? So we just started that. That's why I'm saying for me, it's a little bit new. Yeah, because uh, I'm, really I'm really curious. I can see an advantage to to pointing people to the forums on Steam, right? To basically point them to somewhere that's public that is like, we want to see a lot of people talking about the thing we're working on because when other people see people talking about it, like you were saying, they go, oh, there must be something going on over there because everyone's talking about it, right? But for you to have a Discord, which is then, as I understand it, you can't, like, you can't view what's going on in there unless you're a member, right? Yeah, you basically log in. It's almost like an IRC chat. So right. you know, then you can see the backlog when you do come in, though. Um, so to get to your point a little bit earlier about the importance of community, I think that it is super important, especially with the way that Steam has evolved over time. Uh, it used to be that you could just sort of release a game and being able to be on Steam itself was like a large driver of your sales. But now that's not really a thing. Um, I feel like if you can come out strong, Steam sort of rewards winners really well in the sense that you know, if you have a lot of people who have wishlisted your game, if your first day sales come up really strong, you're a lot more likely to get seen in like the top 10 and all that stuff feeds in on itself. So that's why we were working really hard to get together like a MailChimp list where we've had people signing up for alphas. Um, we have like the Discord, we have Twitter, we have like using the Steam wish lists, for instance, are fantastic because then you can go ahead and when you release, you have this entire pool of people outside of your normal uh, marketing pushes and stuff that you get from Steam that you can also leverage. And if you're able to like, you can sort of imagine the background noise of Steam. If you're able to elevate yourself over that a little bit, you're gonna be much higher ranked than you would be otherwise. I can actually, uh, I want to amend the wish list thing mm -hmm. because uh, me and um, uh, Sergey Gerlonkin, we did a small research on sales trends versus follower numbers on Steam. There is this yep. little follow button on Steam and uh, if you're doing your marketing and saying wishlist my game, we've actually stopped doing that. We're uh, encouraging people to click that follow button because then people get notifications every time you post an update. So the theory is, and it's been proven with a couple dozen games so far, is that the wishlist number, that, uh, sorry, the follower number that you have, half of them will buy the game on day one. And that's a really interesting way to estimate sales. And it makes me sometimes happy, sometimes makes me want to cry when we release a game. 
but so far that has worked for us. And um, just make sure to post a notification when your game is out, like, hey, my game is out. So are you saying like do that in lieu or do both of them? Because I feel like there's a conversion rate for the wish lists. And that you can track that within the admin as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So there's a conversion rate for that. So you're getting a percentage of them, but are you saying like the percentage is higher with following, so that's actually more valuable? Uh, it seems so. We have uh, tracked a few games, and um, it's not visible in your admin or anything. You actually have to go uh, to your community section and then go mm -hmm. to the group, and then the number of followers of your group is the number of followers of your game. And uh, Steam Spy right now tracks that, so you can check your followers on Steam Spy. And come on, we all check our sales on Steam Spy as well. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, I got I to gotta say, he should be on the panel, and I should be running, I should be in his spot. <laughs> what, you, what you think? He's got great answers. You want to switch? No. No. I was just going to echo how, like, how important it is for your literally your day one sales on Steam and mo most platforms to be most important. Like I've seen, um, if you go to you know this this partner.steam powered page, you can see the little chart over time of of like your revenue and you see the spikes and everything. And a lot of the in, uh, analysis that I've seen on this across like lots of games is the shape of all of these curves is just about the same, no matter what the game is, but the, the amplitude is, is different based on how successful it is. And so what I'm really saying is like, yeah, you're gonna see a, like a day one spike and it's gonna trickle down, but if that day one spike, if you're able to get that higher and higher and higher, your whole curve is going to be proportionally higher. Um, and I think one of the big drivers now is the, 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 top, the top new rated lists on Steam. So like if you're at the top of that, then that will feed in, like people say, oh, this is the number one game for today. I should check this out. But like it's, a, it's again, it's like a rich get richer system. And, and even during um, uh, summer sales on Steam, like these are the top games of the last six months and just keep snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. So if you're able to get to the top as, as soon as possible and, and stay there, then um, I think if, if you're gonna put any marketing effort into it, I think take that entire marketing budget and make sure your day one is a hit because it should hopefully level itself out. Well, I think what it is is like you, you need that momentum and as you have a really good trajectory, things start working in your favor. Whereas you see a lot of games that, you know, they release with almost no fanfare. It's sort of like a tree falling in the woods. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is if you don't get like a lot of click through, you don't get a lot of uh, people following through with that, you actually will get delisted and then sort of fall into obscurity. Like getting that initial push is really important. And the cool thing is, is if you have those marketing lists, like MailChimp, you can actually send out emails and you can figure out like what capsule works, what marketing works, what you know phrasing actually gets to your audience. And it may only be like a 10 to 15% boost, but that's enough potentially to separate you from the background noise. Definitely A-B test your marketing. Oh yeah, and it's so easy to do because you just put like a, a Google Analytics link in there and you just say like A to B, okay, like. 30% of people clicked in this one and 20% clicked on this one. Well, I know what I'm going to be using, you know? Don't you think it's crazy how most of the conversation so far is about, like, marketing your product? <laughs> like, nobody's, no, it's, it's almost like making a game has become a solved problem, releasing a game has become a solved problem, and now the problem is how do you sell the thing that you released? <laughs> I said, if you make a damn good game, it'll, I said that, right? And not worry about the f***ing marketing. Right. Just making that clear, okay? Because I actually believe if you, if you make a great game, it will sell itself. I would like someone to show me a really amazing game that has not done well. And if that's the case, it's, it's a study, and someone should really take a look at that. I think there's plenty of can really amazing games. Can anyone think of games. games like that? I can think Gone of hundreds. a couple, yeah. Yeah, I go through like the Steam discovery list all the time. There's just tons of gems in there that nobody like, finds. Uh, so Chad and I have been sitting at the same booth uh, this morning, and we were talking earlier about uh, about like it's like the the concept of like the Steam curation ch challenge, I guess, or what you call it. Like, if you're making if you're making a product that there are a bunch of people who are highly motivated to want to tell other people that your thing is cool, right? Who don't who not, aren't beholden to you in any way, and of course you want to get those people to find you, right? But as it stands, I mean, as I mean, Steam's no more guilty of this than anybody else. Like, all these platforms are majority sales focused. They're not really based on, like, how do you find like a critical darling on Steam, right? Like, there's no such, there's not really any such thing. Like, everything on Steam is either like 
super successful and absolutely huge and has, you know, made all of the money in, in like the last two weeks or it's like released and disappeared. Well, I think, yeah, like any platform, their basic goal at the end of the day is to make as much po money as possible. And isn't it, isn't it? I think, so I would, I would modify that. I would say that's probably their, that's probably their base motivation, but there's still a thing where like, you wanna, like, you kinda want people to think that your thing is cool and that has interesting stuff. Like, I think a lot of the time, like, you think about, like, how all these platforms work. It's like, when you used to go to, like, stores when you were little, yeah. before the internet, before you used to go to stores, like, in person, um, there'd be stores that you'd like because you'd like the people that worked in the stores and you liked the kind of things they had. Like, they had, there was, this, there was a whole, like, feeling about well, being there. Like, you didn't go because you were like, I want a new game, and I know that they sell new games, so that's where I go to get new isn't games. Isn't this why Steam is allowing any game that gives them $100 to be on, on their storefront so that they literally have every game? And the thing that you like is therefore going to be on Steam, and thus mm -hmm. the more games that they have, they're always getting their, their percentage, and so they're right. going to maximize their revenue. Right. I guess, I guess as a totally fudged mathematics exercise... I would say, do you think, probably amortized over time, it's worth it, maybe, but do you think that if you add 100,000 more games to Steam, will they generate enough revenue at, assuming the Steam cut, right? Yeah, it's all assuming the same. Assuming that, like, do you think it's gonna be worthwhile compared to, let's say, like, one day of Battlegrounds so far. Well, yeah, because everyone who wants Battlegrounds is still going to be playing Battlegrounds. That's what they're playing. But all those people who don't want to, you know, spend the money on however much Battlegrounds costs, uh, they're going to pick up those like probably one dollar race to the bottom indie games that that come. Up. The point is, they're going to be spending money on Steam because they're going to have something to spend on Steam. Right, so if there's a right. hundred thousand games, they're going to buy some games. So I think what's going to happen is the average revenue for every indie game developer is going to go way, way, way down because you're, you're splitting mm -hmm. the revenue up. But I think more money is going to be going into Steam because there's more options. And so at the end of the day, Valve's making all the money, which is, I mean, that's right. kind of the whole point. Yeah. Well, I guess my, my point is more, do you think that adding all of these new, put $100 in and you can get your game on Steam, which I don't think is, it's as straightforward as that, but do you think that's really, like, I don't, I don't feel like the primary motivation for that team would be that we can get money from all of these games. I mean, because like you say, fundamentally that's the goal, but realistically is the, is the question more a case of like, we want to make sure that there's a whole diversity of content, right? And then there's things like the challenge, like Tom was saying, of well, like if you play Dota 2 during TI and then Steam's the like, whole point oh man, of, you'd love uh, free to play games. <laughs> You're like, no, I like Dota 2, that's like what I'm playing. Like right. Tom was saying, uh, saturation is happening. Like mm -hmm. there's no doubt about that, right? But also, because so many games are getting on there, uh, as a medium, the games industry is also evolving, and then we have these totally unexpected hits, like, uh, which would not be possible in a curated platform or like in a fully closed platform. So there are drawbacks, and we can't really do anything about that except tell Valve what we think about it. Like, I personally think that uh, there is a severe underestimation of the will that uh, Russian game devs have to put out asset flips. Like, I, I've been in that business uh, before. How do you mean? So, um, if you have a $100 submission fee, and then it costs you $50 to make a game, That's gonna be and then you, right? 50 other dollars to release it, yeah. and then your total profit is, let's say, 250 I mean, I know there is a minimum for the payout and whatnot, but if you do this 500 times, yep. and you have an average of $50 profit, mm -hmm. and that profit, uh, you know, it's more or less stable, a lot of people will be doing that. Like, that, that part is severely I th underestimated. I think Chad and I talked about this maybe a year ago, so it's super yeah. interesting to hear Chad's thoughts on it. So we, we had a whole conversation about this, and it, there is a fascinating thing that are, I actually know quite a few people uh, who are asset flippers, more or less, where they will take a game and they'll maybe, like, swap the art out or they'll reskin it, but the thing is, is, like, statistically speaking, you maybe get 500 to 1,000 copies on Steam, just sort of period, uh, just by being on the storefront, you know, some people will buy it. And you can actually build a business model off of that and actually make a fair amount of money and even more money than some developers who actually have longer and riskier arcs. Do you know or do you have any information if that has changed with refunds coming in? I, I assume that's, um, 
made it worse. I don't have updated information about yeah, that. Yeah, I always, I always wonder if with refunds, is it? Yeah. it's one of the things where people love having it, but they don't really ever use it. Yeah, the other incentive was people were buying them for the cards to get XP to like level themselves. And up that's on what Steam. I was going yeah. to say just now. And Valve, huh. Valve has been trying to address both of those issues, and I don't know what their success rate has been, but that's certainly been a problem historically. Right. Um, I think you know those are the problems that Valve will have to fix, and uh, we can only try and help them. Like. Uh, like I said, asset flippers are a real serious threat. But that said, uh, we're just talking about good games that came out on Steam that did not necessarily do well. I actually have um, an interesting example of that. And again, we probably should switch spots. Um, so we released the final station almost a year ago uh, during PAX West last year. It had, uh, I think, 97% positive uh, review ratings. And the game didn't make that much money. The benefit of the way that we structured our business is that our developers are in Eastern Europe, so the costs are really low. So you know, we sold a couple of uh, thousand copies, and that was good for us developers. Then we did a DLC, and um, the interesting part is that we, we released the DLC, I think, this February. So in February, we did a deep discount for the main game, and it had a ton of push lists on it, and a ton of followers on Steam. And then we released the DLC and the collector's edition. On that day, we made more money than on launch day. And then the long sale is now multitudes of what it was, which I find an interesting case is, uh, you know, show, you were asking, Chris, show me a game that was good and released and didn't do well. That was an example. And I'm sure there is hundreds of others that did not have that benefit of uh, a secondary boost to sales. So one of the things sort of on the point of the indie survival guide is I think that our, our like industry as a whole is getting to the place where music is and a lot of other art forms. The tools now are so democratized that literally anybody in college or with a dream can create almost like a triple A level experience because we have those tools. It used to be that like being able to make a game, the programming knowledge required, the resources, the engine licenses, yeah, we're just so high that being able to make a game was the bar but now, as you can see by the number of titles, the number of developers, that, that's not the bar anymore. And a lot of them are making really good games. So in some ways, like, that marketing and discoverability is a huge part of it, which is why it keeps coming up. But the other thing is that there's tons of alternative business models that I don't think people always talk about. Like, if you want to be sort of like the garage band equivalent of an indie developer, you can make a business out of that by keeping your costs low and making sure that your minimum sustainable sales aren't very high, you know? And you can, you can do those things to increase your chances. Or you can do like, uh, man, St Stardew Valley guy, for instance, had a job, you know, working, I think, at a theater the entire time that he was making Stardew Valley, and he ended up making one of the biggest indie successes of recent history. Right? So there's all these alternative paths and sort of like staying in business and surviving. Um, there's so many ways of doing it. But if you go in there, you know, and you spend all of your money, you spend like hundreds and thousands of dollars, now you have to have that. And if you don't, then the business that you're running is in jeopardy, right? So 5,000 games released on Steam. I've, we've all heard that number over the last year. And there are apparently, according to this group of experts, there was several hundred nuggets in there that have not got their fair share of revenue and attention and so on. You know, I'm highly suspect of this. I think there's something fishy about this. Because gamers are very smart and they will find the, the great games. And they will tell all their friends. And there's a prize in that and saying, I found this game that's amazing, check it out. And imagine this really vocal character that's out there who gets up there and yells to all his friends and his friends say, shh, not interested. I don't believe it. So I can give I, you another example if you want. <laughs> well, you know, we can probably debate this offline, yeah, we could. but every mother thinks their child is beautiful. Let's subtract that <laughs> from the equation. Uh, well, the concrete example they have is uh, we had a game called Speedrunners, which was our first third-party title. Um, the game had released in uh, an offline-only mode on Xbox Live Indie Games. It didn't do well at all. But then we re-released it on Steam with online multiplayer. It didn't do well at all. Uh, that was before Steam reviews was a thing, so you didn't really know if it was good or not. Uh, it was dead for three months. And then uh, this was... 2014 or something, and then YouTubers started playing it. And guess what? 
it took off and then the retention rate was insane and uh, this is our still our biggest top selling game on Steam. So it is situational obviously. So there has to be a bit of a caveat here which is that a really really fantastic game that, ha that has to live out there for a while so that it goes through that growth, that sort of bacterial growth where that bottom part of the curve is just really really flat but eventually, so I guess what I'm really saying is show me a game on Steam that's really truly amazing that's been out there for uh, at least a year or two that nobody's discovered and you're sort of saying you can, what you're really saying is there are tricks and techniques or there are, there's, a, there's a, uh, things you can do, not necessarily a trick, that causes that uptake to happen sooner so that you're getting that revenue sooner because if you've got a winner, you know, if you've got, you've got something that's amazing, you want to get it out there faster to get the revenue. Personally, you know, I'm patient. I actually love to see those, those success stories where they go out there for a while and then they, that, that's actually, I think that's okay. Isn't that what, isn't it that part well, of what makes the it? That's the dream, it? really. I mean, that your yeah. game that you released a few, a year ago, won't take off. Yeah, um, all right. I think um, we can take some questions from the audience. Uh, so if anyone wants to ask a question, please uh, walk on by. I will put the microphone there if uh, someone does. Um, that said, I think um, just to summarize what we've talked about, um, building community on Discord, apparently that's a thing. We should all be trying that. Uh, partnering up with platforms is a really viable way of uh, going ahead and uh, gaining some traction for your game and then doing DLC with um, a free giveaway on a platform. That, is, that has worked for us. Apparently it's also worked for Tumblestone. Um, I do believe that there is a lot of uh, opportunities out there with cool new ideas just coming up to Humble or to whoever uh, and coming up with um, some sort of idea to release a game in a way that makes sense for both parties. Um, then we also talked about building community outside of the traditional spectrum, right? So going, like if you're making a space game, go to a space forum. If you're making a farming game, go to maybe a farming forum, uh, things like that. Um, what else uh, can we take away from this discussion? Maybe if you just make a good game, it'll do okay. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I think there's a slim chance of yeah. that. Um, I do want to re... <laughs> Actually, so, something I'd like, to, I'd like to, to dig into a little bit to kind of get more information about it. Um, it's like the team I'm part of is... Like, it's about six people, hovers around there. Ty, your team is three, two, three? Yeah, three or four, depending on how... Yeah. Chad, your team is... Three full-time, and then we have external contractors, yeah. Okay. Chris, you're working on a project right now, I assume, or you're thinking about it. No, you are. Um, what size is your team? It's a virtual team. It's about... Do you want to hold it? So, oh, sorry, I thought you were interviewing me for a second. I thought that was really quite... <laughs> sorry, that was really bad. Um, about seven people, and uh, some of the people are uh, not going to be able to do their part for a while because it's very early on. I mean, I've literally only been coding for uh, a month. So um, a lot of design, I did design for six months. I mean, we don't want to go too far into this, but I love the virtual team. I love folks that have regular jobs that are on the team. I love that they have a deep expertise and that they bring a lot of passion and they can do it on their weekends and their evenings and, and the costs are kept extremely low. Mm -hmm. Love all that. that. That's what makes it actually really cool. So, this is, I mean, I'm not trying to f force your uh, PR hand right now, but um, do you have a rough idea of when you plan to release it? Yeah, um, I think right now we're looking at uh, the middle of next year okay. for a release. And, you know, the cool thing is, is that I'm trying to break, like, I don't know how you guys all work, but what I'm finding is, is that, you know, deadlines are important, but when you have the opportunity to let stuff really gestate and really marinate, you know, that you come up with some really cool and interesting ideas. And that's the power of indie. Uh, because when you're in a corporate environment, which I was in for damn near 30 years, okay, including my own corporate environment, literally, I created the culture of the company. It was 18 years, Gas Powered Games, and then as GM of Wargaming. Um, you just don't get the same kind of creativity. You don't get the magic, and you don't get that avant-garde, and I feel like the, ru the breaking the rules. I will promise you all, when you play what I'm playing, there's rules getting broken everywhere. Like, 
that is so exciting where, you know, large corporations would say, oh, no, I'll have nothing to do with that. And I love that. That's the best. So if, I feel like if you're an indie developer and you're not breaking rules and you're not doing things specifically that large corporations, Fortune 500 companies, um, wouldn't touch, if you're not doing those things, then you're wasting an opportunity. You've, you know, you've, you've, you've gone to the nude beach and you kept your clothes on. What the hell? So how do you let your ideas gestate if your game doesn't perform and you've no money? You need to have a plan B. Like uh, uh -huh. in the FTL discussion, I think that was the best advice from that panel. Yeah. Uh, like they moved to China to live off you know, their savings. Always have a plan B. Like uh, we have indie devs that pitch games to us and then they go like, oh yeah, you know, well we just need this amount of money and then uh, we're fine. I'm like, well, did you count the time between like you know release and then <laughs> and certification, yeah. and then that you know there is a platform delay and then it takes us some time to work through the payments and then suddenly the budget implodes. Um, for, like I've seen a lot of uh, game developers who have become successful with having a plan B. And then you, when you look at them, you go like, oh yeah, they're probably, you know, they did the super Meat Boy scenario where it went all in. No, they've been doing this for five years now. And it's not their first game. You just don't know about the previous game. Right. I think that's also uh, adding on to our, uh, you know, marketing discussions is having a plan B, I think, would be a really solid takeaway here. Sure. Well, I think that's like going back to having like a garage band or like running shows locally. I mean, if you have really low operating costs and you're doing this on the weekend, like you can make games but not put yourself at terrible risk, right? Like the bigger your game is, um, with like the AAA studios, for instance, they have to make like a very large amount of money uh, to pay for, you know, 30 people. You're talking like millions of dollars of budget where they have to make that back to even like make a dollar. Whereas if you can make a game for like next to nothing, then you don't really have to do a whole lot, or you can even support yourself in other ways. Like, I do a lot of consulting, and that actually helps pay for development as well. Yeah. Uh, as an indie, I would highly recommend Moonlighting. Like, they're, they're, no, I'm serious. Like, uh, if you're just starting out like I did, I was, I was basically a, a one or a half of the, the team, um, but I was like working at Microsoft as my day job and like sacrificing my nights and weekends and sanity to to make the game and that's that's uh, a great way to like stay stable in your life and um, and actually make your project uh, without needing publisher funding. Hey, uh, just to play uh, devil's advocate first, I kind of agree on what Chris said, <laughs> and well, but. I think it's all about definitions, right? If your definition of a good game includes, hey, this game is unique and remarkable and has a good hook, then definitely, right? But sometimes if the design is solid, it might not still catch people's attention. Um, but while you're, I don't know, let me move on to my actual question is, um, I'm curious on how each of you uh, fund your games at the moment, right? Like, this is what you guys were actually just talking about, which is great. Um, so like Ty mentioned, he did Moonlighting before, but I'm curious, for the, like your current games, how are you each funding your game? So I think uh, for uh, both Chris's, it's clear, right, more or less. Like you, you guys, um, in, in the example of Radio, you have uh, your uh, IP supporting you. Uh, and Chris, I assume you have some investments or you know? Something? No, I, I can answer that. So I'm burning my own cash. Um, I went out initially to raise money. I got a pretty good response. Um, and then I thought to myself, why do I want to raise money early? I want to burn a bunch of my own cash and get the game much, much further along so that it's much more, so, so investors can see what it is. And so what that does is it raises the investment and it lowers the percentage that they would get. I'm bullish on what I'm creating, okay? I'm not sitting there going, I wonder if this is gonna be a success. There's only one path forward, really and that is to be successful at what I'm doing. Uh, I joke about being a goat farmer or whatever, right? That's just jokes. Um, uh, I, let's not go there. The, um, um, the point being that, you know, if you believe in what you're doing, I believe you can spend your, your own money. You know that saying, other people's money? I don't love that, because when you spend other people's money, you get other people's drama and you get all of the paperwork and the lawyers and the bankers, and I did that for a long time. I used publishers' money to fund my games, and it comes with a shitload 
of overhead. It's like you're in a constant marriage divorce state, you know, where you're having a beautiful steak dinner on one night and then you're arguing over a fucking milestone on another night. And you're like, it's, it's horrible. And then you're supposed to be brilliant in the meantime, right? And it's really super hard to do. So I think uh, for me personally, the path I'm going down, I'll burn uh, 250, 350, 450 of my own money, and then I'll go out there and I'll, I'll get the uh, investors involved. All right. Um, Radial has no investors. I don't think any of you do either. Is that true? Um, we subsist currently on the goodwill, I guess, that we've received from porting the game to other platforms, things like that. Um, as a team, I don't know if this was like initially really covered, but like as I think that, well, are you making a VR game? Maybe you can't tell anyone. Okay. Um, so as the only team making a VR title, uh, right now we're in a really interesting position where what we have is uh, a team that know how to make stuff in VR, know how to make it good, have like a lot of experience doing it. Um, and so platforms want to work with us because they know that we can do it and we've shipped a thing before, like we released Contraption with the Vive when it launched. Um, so we get to, we get to, right now we're in a reasonably good position where what we get to do is they come to us and they say, could you make something for this? And we say, yeah, we probably could. And then we get to do it. And it's like, it all feels very, uh, incredibly unrealistic to how it is elsewhere. <laughs> so. Um, I guess my situation is, uh, like, like I said, I, I was moonlighting on the bridge, which basically is it's still paying my bills, uh, but um, that's a pretty unique situation. Just in general, uh, I guess my advice to, to creating a team of people and paying them without actually having money is to do that in RevShare, which is the way I've always worked with my team. I don't pay, like my team, we don't pay out like, here, you get like X amount of money per year, you get X percentage of the profits once we ship, and that allows us to be super lean because basically our cost to making this game is our living expenses. And like, if you were able, if you were able to live off savings or you know live off of your partner or whatever, however you uh, survive, um, then then you can make the game and just split on revenue share. So we just have to like pay for like the mega booth and some right. marketing, but uh, that's relative to like what a salary would be. That's a fairly low percentage. Yeah, just to kind of hop into that, if you're, I mean, I think most people here are sort of professional or semi-professional at this point, but. Um, a couple of friends of mine run a team in Australia called League of Geeks, um, and they did a really awesome thing when they started their project where they implemented a point system, where basically instead of, it was, it was like a really uh, intricately designed rev share yeah. that was basically valuing tasks based on like a kind of currency, and so if you could make, if you could tackle a task that was like worth five points, then you got five points of rev share at the end. And it was also interesting because they could like inflate the points over time. Um, but anyway, so if you're thinking of building a team and you sort of like Ty is saying, you're like, well, I could offer rev share, but like Chris was sort of saying, I don't really want to offer someone 30% of a game that might end up being amazing because I don't want to leave 30% to someone else, um, then implementing a system like that can be super useful and it's a good way to kind of uh, handle that stuff. I've definitely thought about the point system as well. And it's, it's really it's, interesting, it's, yeah. It's interesting, or, but the thing is there's so much overhead to that. At the end of the day, it just, way easier. Like, I, I used to work at Microsoft, and all the full-time employees were basically paid a salary, and that meant, like, I was getting paid about the same to do 80-hour works on Xbox, work weeks on Xbox, as someone casually doing a 35 on Bing. That kind of felt a bit unfair, but at the same time, I was, you know, enjoying my job and everything, but just kind of hammering out the percentages at, at, at the beginning, um, and maybe changing the percentages of people come on the team and whatnot, but kind of figuring that out all, all out and solidifying based on work commitment. And now if you're seriously like under committing, then we can, you can go and evaluate that. But basically just having it fixed, not thinking about it, because on a small team you wear so many hats and have so many other things to think about than managing these tiny little point values. Sure, maybe based on, on my hourly work or their hourly work, someone's getting paid a little bit more or less, but at the end it just kind of comes down to, to trust and that, like, yes, everyone's putting in the same time, more or less, into the project based on your percentages. And um, uh, if, yeah. Chad, how are you funding? Well, uh, so I'm funding it basically through a combination of my own personal money and loans that I've gotten from things like family members and stuff. So I don't know if I recommend doing that because... <laughs> 
yeah, the idea of not being able to make back that money is existentially terrifying because I've got like three kids and you know the whole thing. So um, yeah, uh, trying to keep my burn rate super low and trying to keep my minimum success rate super low is how I've been managing that and trying to not to go like super deep into debt. So I don't need to sell like millions of copies or even hundreds of thousands of copies to make a profit. I only need to sell like a little bit. All right, so your advice is not really that great. <laughs> But well, uh, I mean, people so do that. People do that. If, uh, if you can get somebody else to like take the risk for you, then you should probably do that. One thing that, that right? uh, I would like to add to that, like we've had situations exactly like that with our devs, and uh, Chris just told, don't work with publishers, and whatnot. I mean, there is merit to that. There is overhead. Uh, one thing that we did with a couple of projects is uh, we actually dictated the scope of it based on the amount of alpha pre-sales. And that goes in line with like you know building communities on Discord, building like out the public alphas, and then starting to sell essentially pre-orders on your own website in exchange for giving access to behind the scenes and then giving the the people the key on uh, launch day. And that has worked and has minimized risks. That's just something again uh, you can bend the rules and create your own rules in this industry, which is why I love it. You can just come up with something new and it might fail and no one will hear about or it might work and then it will become the new norm. So like part of my design process is to make games that are systemic and sandbox. And the cool thing about them is they can scale up almost infinitely. Like you can take the kernel of something like Kerbal Space Program and just go nuts with it. And I'm doing the same thing with Phantom Brigade in the sense that like, okay, what can I do? I can add like research and development and new missions and blah, blah, blah. I have like a hundred things I could add, but my goal is to get like the absolute core of the game rock solid and have people understand that. And I can have them test that basically today, uh, and figure out if that's working or not before I invest more money into it. Uh, I can see Lurica's angry ears staring at me. <laughs> um, guys, okay, thanks a lot for the panel. Please, a round of applause. Um, we will take this whole discussion over beers tonight, and I assume there will be some strangling uh, happening. Uh, thanks a lot for the discussion. Uh, we're going to break for five, 10 minutes uh, to go to the bathroom, mingle a little bit, and then uh, we'll continue.